Here's 18. Put your point at it. I got it. We got the point slope form, meaning we just need a point and a slope to use it. Y minus y1 equals m the slope times x the number minus x the x from a point. Okay, so let's check this out. Y minus, okay, so what comes next is the y value in the point. Is that what they have? Two, yeah, look, it comes right from that point right there, two. Equals three, the slope, times x minus, okay, what comes next is the x value from that point. Is that what they have? No. What do they have? Should they should have a minus negative 4. Mm, that's what they should have. So that should read not x minus 4, but actually x minus negative 4 or plus 4. Or plus 4. We can simplify this plus 4. That's what they should have. And then you know, it changes it a little bit. Just changes the numbers around. Similar to 20, we'll, we'll do 23 still, or sorry, 24, but I'm also going to do uh, another one. Uh, all right, so on to number 20. So we got a point. That's good. Well, what else do we need? We need another point, or we need a slope. It's uh, really what we need. We need another point, or we need a the slope. There's not really anything else that we could uh, partner with that point and get the equation of the line. We either need a second point, or we need a slope. Okay. So this information can that tell me about another point that the line goes through? These, we don't know what points these guys have in common. Actually, they have none in common because they're parallel, right? Oh, yeah. What does this, what's the fact that this is parallel to this line tell me about that line? It's the same slope. The same slope. That's all. Don't get confused here. The only piece of useful information here is that this slope is negative 4. This line that goes to this point is parallel. So this one must have a slope of? Also negative 4 because... Parallel slopes, or parallel lines, have equal slopes. Ready? A girl. What? I said that a girl. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we got a point, we got a slope, and now we can go what? We can write the equation of this line. So, well, we can do that one of two ways. We can do the point slope form, which I will do. And we can do the slope intercept form and solve for d and plug d back in. I'll use the slope inter the uh, point slope form. So that's y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So y plus 5 equals negative 4 times x plus 3. y plus 5 equals negative 4 x minus 12 that negative 4. Subtract 5 from both sides, negative 4, x minus 17. Done. Now that I have y by itself, it's all done. Real quick, I'll show you one time, but the other way is if we have a point in the slope. Or if we use y equals mx plus v, fill in the pieces that we know. We know y is negative 5. We know m is negative 4. We know x is negative 3, and we don't know what b is, so solve for b. 5 equals 12, subtract 12, negative 17 is b, so y equals negative 4x minus 17. And just took that and plugged it into the equation. Good? Question? Stop. Maybe you have questions, but I'm going to continue with you. That was 20, I want to use 23, and then we can talk about 24. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so this one goes through a point like perpendicular to some It's not parallel to this, to this line, but uh, doesn't perpendicular also tell us something about the slope? Yes. Oh, definitely it does. So this slope is one third. So this slope is negative three. Negative three. Right? Opposite reciprocals. Opposite reciprocals. Well, then it's all the same. Right? Y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Y times y1 equals negative three x plus 12. Y equals negative three x plus 13. Just telling us about the slope. Slope is the opposite reciprocal of these uh, lines are perpendicular. Uh, All right, there we go. We got, got a point there. We got perpendicular to this line. Now, this line, what kind of a line is just y equals a number? Across horizontal. Ah, it's horizontal. It's not vertical. It's horizontal. Geez. Just to remind you, look at, look at the x y plane. Maybe the x axis and the y axis. Where on here is y equal to negative two? Down on the vertical axis, the y axis. There. So then it spans across. Yes. Yeah, so anything that is two below the x axis, that's where y is equal to negative two, and nowhere else. Oh. Okay. And you put it as the x axis, y axis. This is our line that is all points that have a y of negative 2. All of those points have a y of negative 2. What's the slope of this line? It's um, 0. It's 0. It's 0 over well, wait, anything. Right, 0 divided by anything is, is 0. Here, let, let's, if you're not sure, let's look at uh, the line itself. Let's find the rise over the run. Okay, rise, go up how much? Zero. None. Zero. Run, rise. Right. The rise is zero. There's no rise at all. We don't go up or down anything. We just stay right there. So we rise nothing, and we run how much? About three. Three? About 75 million. Does it matter how much we run? No. 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 Over doesn't matter. Our dungeon master. What? <laughs> <laughs> you know what dungeon master is? Not really. Uh, if you do, then I would like to learn how to play. Um, rise over run, zero over, doesn't matter, because anything that divides zero winds up being zero. So this is a slope of zero. Okay? Let's look at the line. What kind of line would be perpendicular to this line? Uh, a vertical line. A vertical line. line. Horizontal equals vertical. Something. X equals something. X equals something. But also, uh, Why not? Let's just look at the graph. This is the vertical line that has to go through this point. Negative 6, 2. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2. The vertical line has to be perpendicular to the horizontal line. It has to go through the point negative 6, 2. It has to go through here. It has to be perpendicular to this line. That's the line we're looking for. What's an equation that will tell me the, that one? Let's see that that one. X equals 1. Right? That's the x value. Yeah. Okay, so how about this? The slope is zero for this line, so the slope is, this is going to be kind of silly, negative one over zero, right? Opposite reciprocal. So that's kind of silly, because if the slope is zero, is it positive? Is this a, is this a positive slope? No. Is this a negative slope? No. There's no opposite of it, right? So the, the, the negative part, that's kind of silly. 1 over 0. What kind of a number is 1 over 0? Undefined. Undefined. You cannot divide by 0. Right? So technically the opposite of 0 is undefined. The opposite. reciprocal of 0. Okay. Yeah. What is there the is opposite, no opposite of 0? Of zero. Oh, okay. In numbers, opposite means negative if you're positive and positive if you're negative. Right? Opposite of 3 is negative 3. Opposite of negative 5 is positive 5. Those are opposites in, in number world. Okay. Opposites. You ever think about they teach you opposites in, in first grade like it's really easy. Like they start, what's the opposite of up? Yeah. Down. Okay, so that's easy. <laughs> opposite of left is right, you good. Left is right, opposite of forward is backward. What's the opposite of red? Blue. Blue. What's the opposite? Green. Blue. What's all the negative on the color wheel? Okay, so that, let's, do, let's call that the opposite. 
What's the opposite of a toaster? An oven. No, I no. I read French are toast, 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 nothing. I don't know why because it makes stuff soggy. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Different yeah. cooking problems. Oh, water. Water. No, wait. Soggy. Soggy. With up and simple, wait, yeah. hold on. With up and simple, there is just one, it only has one dimension, one attribute. It, it's upness is all that it, it is. But if I try to say the opposite of an object, like a toaster, so, okay, so a toaster oh, gets hot, so, so oh, the opposite freezer. has to get cold. <coughs> the toaster has two slots, so I have to have something that has oh, one door two freezer. pegs. So something gets cold and has two things that stick out of it. And you put bread in a toaster, so what's the opposite of bread? What would I put in this thing? Or maybe you don't put things into it, it puts tortilla. things out. Do you see how many things have to be the opposite? Yeah, you got a tortilla here. It just doesn't. We teach kids right. opposites like the watch. simplest thing, but just not everything has an opposite. So I'm saying there's no opposite of a toast. There's no opposite of a that desk. makes sense. No opposite of a piece of paper. What's the opposite of me? Not you. <laughs> you. Okay. So I guess the opposite of you is everybody else. I don't know. I guess. If you want to go, in opposites are weird. For anyway. Um, so the slope is 1 over 0. That's an undefined slope. That's a vertical line. Und vertical lines have undefined slopes. Horizontal lines have zero slopes. So don't need to be a vertical line. You should know that all vertical lines have the, the equation x equals some number, right? whatever x value they go through. That's a vertical line. Moving right along, unless someone stops me, which I welcome. I welcome you to stop me with the valid questions. Thirty-four. Nah. Twenty. Nah. So this is a y two minus one. What's that now? Is that a y two minus y one? All right. Thank you. That's something we can find out about this line: the slope by y two minus y one over x two minus x one. Make that x a little bigger. <laughs> so we're just going to call some point 2 and some other point 1 and go to, go to work. I'll call this one 2 and this one 1. So m equals 2 minus negative 4 over negative 1 minus 3. 6 over negative 4, negative 3 halves. That's the slope of this line. Right? Good so far? Too fast? Too slow. Should I go back in time and go faster than I did? Um, so now we have a slope. We need more information than just a slope, right? Slope's not enough. What else? What other information do we have? Uh, y-intercept. Do we have a y-intercept? Uh, what? Do we know what the y-intercept is? No, we we'll have two know points to figure we it out. We need one, is what I'm saying. Do we need a y-intercept? I feel like we do. B. Well, I mean, yeah, in the end, we need to have, but I, it's not like I need to find the y-intercept right now Okay. and plug it in, well, unless I, I can go about that way. I have a slope and I have a point, right? Actually, I have a slope and I have a choice between two points, this point, this point, either one I want. Right? If we jump back to uh, this guy right here, once we got to the point that we had a point and a slope, we were able to put it in the point-slope form. Solve for y, and there's the equation. So I'll use this point. I like to pick the point that has both positives, but that doesn't exist in this uh, case. So let's pick that one. Is y not? So y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. So y minus 2 equals negative 3 halves times x plus 1 minus 2 equals negative 3 halves x minus 3 halves. Just distributing that negative 3 halves. I'm going to add 2 to both sides, but when I add 2 to negative 3 halves, I need a common denominator. So I'm going to do 4 halves. That's 2. That's adding 2. y equals negative 3 halves x plus Okay. <laughs> that was it. Right, 
Bridgeport was in. That was the last one. Okay. Seven both sides. Negative four nine x minus one. As long as we got here, that's what matters. If we did it with slope intercept form, solve for v and plug that back in, that's fine too. Two points, we got those two points, we're gonna find the slope, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. I'm going to do 5 minus negative 7. I did that, that. I'm going to go negative 3 minus 6. That's 5 plus 7. That's 12. Negative 3 minus 6. That's negative 9. That's negative 4 thirds. That's our slope. And choose a point. Doesn't matter which one. I'll choose this one. Y minus negative 7 equals negative 4 thirds times x minus uh, x1, which is 6. Y plus 7 equals negative 4 thirds x plus uh, 8. And y equals negative 4 thirds x plus 1 when I subtract 7. Questions, old type questions from uh, the previous sections. Because in grading those homework reviews, see we need some more practice, so just keep practicing until we get it. Alright, so let me pull out a graph. I need a set of axes. See if I if I approach it this way. piecewise function stuff is really testing, do you understand that a function is an input-output machine? Okay? Do you understand that? All this thing can do is take things in for x and give you out a y value. Same thing here, same thing with any function. Okay? The only thing that's different is, this function as a whole, you can plug any x into here, but when you go to plug it into the function, you have to decide which of these plugging that number into, okay? And this graph is a picture of that, that choice making, okay? Uh, so, let's start with this guy right here. This in lavender. 
for those values of x, less than or equal to 7. Those are the values of x that you can, uh, well, uh, that you would plug into this function. And that uh, this function will give you the outputs for these particular inputs. The graph of this function is the only graph you will see for these x values, for these inputs. Where are those inputs on this graph? Where is 7 on the graph, or x equals 7 on the graph? <coughs> Right here on the x-axis, okay? We're really concerned only with x values that are equal to 7 or less than 7. So, this is the far right of the x values that we would possibly plug into this top function. <coughs> Anything to the left, anything less than 7 as well. This is where this graph is going to exist in this area to the left of negative se or of positive 7. And not only to the left of 7, but also right at 7. You don't have to draw, you don't have to highlight, you don't have to draw this vertical dotted line. They're not actually parts of the graph, right? but they're helpful little guiding objects to help us see what's going on. So I'm highlighting this x is less than or equal to 7, the same color as this area, to literally highlight the fact that we only want to graph that top function here, to the left, for x values that are less than 7. It's the only place I want to see that graph. It's the only time I want to see the output of that function. After that, after x gets beyond 7, this is the function that I will use. There we go. I got it. For x is greater than 7, I will use that graph. I will use that function to find the outputs. That would be to the right. All over here, to the right. Okay. So this is the domain, literally the domain, right? The domain means the set of all inputs. This is the domain for this function. This over here, to the right of 7, that's the domain of this function. I got 7, that also falls in the domain of this function, because it has the equals to part. So you're going to graph that function right there in the, the lavender section. It's got a y-intercept of negative 4. Got a slope of negative 3 7, so that's down 3 over 7. Closed circle? Is that right? How do I know it's a closed circle? That's where the equal, that's, that's the function you use when x is 7. That's the function that gives you the output. That's the function that tells you the y value of the point. by drawing that graph, that is telling you like, when you go to this x value, it is, it's already chosen the top function to give you the output, right? If you go to negative one, the output is gonna be negative three point something, something around negative three, right? That's what the graph is telling us. If you go to negative seven, you're gonna get the output from this function. If you go to anything that's less than seven, the output will be decided by this function right here. This is the graph of that function. That's the output you get from that graph, from that function. Now we need to graph this guy right here, where x is greater than 7. You can see by the fact that it's highlighted yellow, that's where x is greater than 7. How do we do that? That's up to you. Okay. It has a y-intercept of negative 12. I can use that. And then use the slope from there. It's up to you. But I don't want any graph left over here from this function. Okay, so if I do draw something over here that's from that function, I need to erase it when I'm done. So I can do this. I got a y-intercept of negative 12. I got a slope slope of up one over two, or sorry, up two over one. All right, up, up, up. Or I can say if I go, if I'm going to go over seven. 
I run with seven, how much should I rise? Because the ratio is always two to one. 14. 14, right? If I go up two over one, up two over one, two over one, I can do that step by step by step. Or I could just go all the way over to seven, right? Seven moves to the right, and I should do 14 up. That's just what you make there. Okay. Well, all these guys, I should get rid of them. But they did help me get to right here, where I'll put an open circle, okay? Because the closed circle belongs to this graph here. And then I'll follow the slope. And I'll go ahead and get rid of that, that, this, there, there. Does that make a little more sense? A little more sense for piecewise functions? The pieces are the x's. The x's decide which graph goes where. to 14. That means that there's some number inside here, this, all of this stuff comes out to be some number. When we take the absolute value of that, we get 14. Right? Well, what number could be inside the absolute value when I get 14? Negative 14. Negative 14. 14. That one. Also? 14. Positive 14. Is confusing. This is why, because we can take the absolute value of negative 14, yeah, or the absolute value of 14. We're saying that this stuff could be negative 14. It could come out to be 14. Either way, that equation works. That's why we take 3x plus 7 and say it could be negative 14, or 3x plus 7 could be equal to positive 14. Either way, if that stuff inside the absolute value comes out to be 14 or negative 14, the equation is true. The same is true when we have stuff over here, not just a number, but some stuff. All of this can come out to be exactly the same as the stuff over here. Right, we put an x value in there, and this side and this side are identical to each other. That can happen. The absolute value of, of this would absolutely be equal to the, this value here, as long as that's positive. Or, 4x minus 5 could be equal to the exact opposite of all that stuff. The exact opposite of 3x plus 12. Put an x value there and an x value there. And this comes out to be negative that. So that's fine, because I'm going to take the absolute value of that negative number and get a positive number. As long as this comes out to be positive, and this stuff comes out to be positive, that's all that matters. So. We solve the equation, subtract 3x from both sides, add 5 to both sides, x equals 17. That's possible. We solve this equation. Distribute the negative first. Add 3x, add 3x, add 5, 5. So we get 7x plus 0 equals 0 minus 7. Divide by 7, x equals negative 1. Okay, up to there, are there any questions? With that, with this thing, with this guy over here. Okay, now are we done? Yeah. You have to check for extraneous solutions. That means solutions that don't work. Extra solutions that are not in the set of actual solutions. Now, why? What would happen that would tell me hey, that solution doesn't work? That's not possible. 
this number here comes out to be negative because what we would be saying there is the absolute value of some number is some negative number. That's absolutely not the definition of absolute value. Absolute values always come out to be positive. So you just gotta plug it into really here and see if it comes out to be positive. Okay. So three times 17 plus 12, is that gonna be positive? Yeah, absolutely. I don't even know what number that is, but I do know it's positive. That's all that matters. If I plug in negative one there, I get three times negative one plus 12. Now this is a negative number, but we're subtracting it from 12. It's still positive. Yeah. So this also is a solution. Okay. That's it. Hmm. Go ahead and all right, we're going to talk about something called direct variation. The primary reason I have, well, I guess the primary reason I have for uh, teaching you this is it's a state standard and I'm supposed to talk to you. But also, there are, well, you're expected to understand what it means to say y varies directly with x, or y is directly proportional to x, or a sports team's attendance is directly proportional to its winning percentage. Okay. You may hear people say things like that. Try to pay attention when, you, when you're reading and you're listening to people say things. See how often now you hear somebody say, directly proportional to, directly proportional to, directly proportional to. Okay. See how often you hear that now. Once you learn something new or something new is pointed out to you, you tend to hear hear it more, because you're, you're, it's in your brain, you're paying attention to it, and you have to notice it. So uh, think about that. Well, what does it mean to say y varies directly with x? Wait. Or y is directly proportional Y and X could be any things that you want out in the world. Okay. I can take a guess. Okay. Um, if Y goes up, X goes up. If Y goes down, Y goes down. And if Y is proportional to some random number, X is going to be proportional to that same number in the same way. Okay. Uh, generally, when people use it in everyday language, they generally just mean as X goes up, Y goes up. Directly, like they have a direct relationship. So direct that it's, it's this direct. If I want to get y, right? Y is the output, right? So I want to get y and I'm given x. How do I get y? I take x and I multiply it by some constant number called the constant of variation. A is called constant. this maybe two or three times right now. When you say that y varies directly with x, or y is directly proportional to x, it may sound like a mouthful, this is all it means. This is the definition of something being directly proportional to something else or vary, varying directly with something else. y varies directly with x it means this equation exists. Okay? Look it up in the dictionary, the definition of directly proportional to, I'm oversimplifying here because if you actually look it up in the dictionary, first of all, it probably won't be there because it's a lot of words. Phrase is not a word. And uh, they may have a little more to say about it, but it, it basically means this equation exists. There is a, it's possible to relate y and x by multiplying x by some constant x number. Okay. So let's look at some equations that may not look exactly like this. And uh, ask ourselves, is that direct variation? That's direct variation. Um, y equals 2x. Is that direct variation? Does it look like that equation? Yeah. If it didn't, could it? Uh, y equals 5x plus 2. Is that direct variation? Hmm. There's no plus anything over here. If there isn't plus anything, it's plus what? Zero. Nothing. Yeah, zero. So if I have a plus 2, that's not direct variation. Okay. About uh, y equals x over 2. Yes. So I, if, it's, if it is direct variation, I should be able to write it as 
y equals a, you know, a times x. What is that a? Technically, it's 1 over 2. It is 1 over 2. Divide something by 2, multiply something by 1 half, exact same operation. Still <coughs> So it is direct variation. Now let's, let's see, yeah. Yes, no. Because I can write it like this, yes. Um, 3y equals x. Yeah. 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 Braxton? Divide by 3. Divide by 3. The y equals, how do I write it this way? Oh, times 1 third. Times 1 third. 1 third times x. Yes. Divide both sides by 3, it is possible to write it as y equals a constant times x. As long as it's possible to write it as y equals a constant times x, it's called direct variation or direct proportionality or what? Okay. Um, should we talk about that? Let's talk about what kinds of things in the real world are directly proportional or very directly with some other thing. I'd like you to take a second and just try to think about that. Is it, is it possible to take, um, to take this x, multiply by some constant, and then it can give y and x be so that they, there is a direct proportionality uh, in the real world. Can you think of anything? I just take the <coughs> stuff, multiply it by just one number, and that gives me some you know, meaningful output. The cost of gas is directly proportional to how much you fill your car with. Okay, so like the, uh, the, the, the cost to me at the gas pump is directly proportional to the amount of gas that I buy, is that true? Let's see. So, cost of, let's just call it a fill up. Okay. Is, uh, is directly proportional to or varies directly with what? Gallons. Gallons. Let's see. Can we write that equation? Y equals what's y? The cost to fill up. The cost. Right, this stuff right there. Cosine. Is equal to uh, well, x would be the number of gallons. And what would this be? That would be how would be Money. How much it costs per gallon? How much it costs per gallon? Yeah, the rate. We talked about the rate of change, the slope, or the exact same. Right? So what kinds of numbers would, would be realistic to go here? $3.42. $3.42, that's believable. Right? 0. 0.82? 0. 0.82 believable? This day and age? In this economy? Yeah. Yeah. 0. 0.82? Yeah. Not 4.82. 0. 0.82. Oh, it's not even. No. Okay. 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 Point. Point 0.82, what would that mean? Zero. I get it now. All the gas in the world. Not even far ago. 82 cents a gallon. We have all the gas That's how much it, it, it cost me. <laughs> hey, gents, ladies, but mostly gents. When I was in high school, it was as low as 82 cents. Yeah, my grandpa told me when gas was like super, super low. That was when dinosaurs were really cool. Who did your grandpa say? Just tell the guy at a, 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 a gas station a nice story, and it's like, sounds very entertaining, gives you some gas. And how candy is, all candy can be a penny. Candy? Oh, penny candy? Yep. It's actually called penny candy. Any other thing that, there's so many things. Oh, 
Amount of dead fish in the ocean varies directly with nuclear waste put in the ocean. Oh, oh. So the amount of dead fish in the ocean varies directly with the amount of the nuclear waste you know, put into the ocean? Yeah. Oh, you want to mean? <laughs> Seems like it could be. Okay. It may not be exactly like that. Maybe some other factors. You might need to take it like how many gallons. Yeah, what about a cubic tons of Okay, so now we, okay, so we measured it in cubic tons, and that translates like we just multiply it by like pounds five, and that's how many pounds of fish there are that are dead in the ocean. Maybe, maybe but maybe also like, say I put five nuclear waste, whatever you're measuring it, five into the ocean, and I get fifteen dead fish. I put ten in the ocean, and I get even more, more than just a factor of that, more than just. Like, so if I put in 5 and I get 15, if I put in 10 and I get 1,000 dead fish, yeah. the proportionality is not direct. I don't know what it's like. Because maybe you put more in and they breed and I don't know. But yes, maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe it is direct. Or them to even like, huh? stay alive longer. Yeah. They could. That's you got some. Well, you have like yeah, a yeah, nuclear, yeah, nuclear yeah, power plant yeah, in what is it, like yeah, Russia yeah. or that area, yeah. like you know, that rain <laughs> that like exploded and everything, and like everything is just toxic. Yeah. Yeah. There's like toxic waste, and there's still a lake, and there's a fish in that lake that is actually still alive and is thrived in that lake. That's weird. So. How do they know that? Well, yeah. let's drop off of this conversation because right. it could take forever. Uh, I just did a Google search. Okay, I just did a Google search for the phrase "is uh, directly proportional to" because that's when people say it and they write it down. They more often say it's directly proportional to. They don't usually say "very directly with." Apparently, they just sound better uh, in the English language. I just did some uh, Google search. Oh, here's the headline right here: Brain Learning Ability is directly proportional to curiosity. Does that seem like a directly proportional relationship? I'm curious. <laughs> if you're more curious, do you think you can multiply your curiosity by say five and that tells you how much learning potential you have? No. My toxic critic rates one better than that. <laughs> <laughs> Does that seem believable? Uh, yeah. Does it seem like there's that kind of relationship? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Take curiosity, multiply by five. I don't know what they're measuring curiosity. What are the units of cats? Curiosity? Stupid cats. question. Cats. That would be a good curiosity. I'm three cats curious. Okay. <laughs> and then you multiply the number of cats curious you are, and you're, I don't know what you're measuring learning ability in. Einstein's or something. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is talking about the in Miami, Miami hockey team. Uh, attendance directly proportional to the team's winning percentage. Yeah. That's what you did. 75% winning times some number gives you how many people you could expect to see attending your game. Seems like, okay, that seems believable. Um, let's see, now let's get that one for a second, just a second. Uh, here we go, here's one about a video game. Um, weight of the player is directly proportional to movement or the speed at which it moves. The heck does that mean? <laughs> if well, let's read it again. If you're heavier, you don't run as fast. In the game? <laughs> Better drop some gear. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Out of my backpack. Let's, let's keep looking at this. The weight, okay, weight, like how heavy the player is, like the, the avatar of the player, uh, is directly proportional to Let's jump to what they're clarifying here. The speed at which it moves. Oh, I get it now. So I thought it was a gamer. Running. Like, if you're like no. 300 pounds sitting on your couch, you're going to no. move slower. Uh, no, no like, try the, the avatar. So, if your avatar is 300 pounds, you're going to move okay. slower than avatar. Now, wait a minute. Thing. Listen to what you're saying. You're saying if your avatar is heavier, you'll move more slowly. That seems. That seems yeah, that's what it makes sense. Look what it says. It says the weight of the player is directly proportional to the speed at which it moves. Let's, let's write this down. This is what they're saying. Okay, weight, weight 
is directly proportional and varies directly with speed. So they're saying that this is y, this is x. And there's some a that you can multiply x by to get y. You can multiply your speed by a and get your weight. Wait a minute. As, I, as I, my speed gets bigger, this equation says that my weight gets bigger. Gets bigger. So that doesn't make no, sense. it's not legit. Doesn't seem to make sense. Whoever wrote that. <gasps> well, hold on. Could oh, you make it, it the other way around. What do you think if it were a fraction? What if it was y equals one third x? Doesn't y still get bigger as x gets bigger? Yeah. What if yeah. you switched them around? It's not what bigger than x, but it's bigger than it used to be. What if speed yeah. is directly proportional to weight, not like if you switch speed and weight around? Well, we are. If I, I'll remind you that we already have looked at that. Actually. <coughs> like, if we have three times y equals x, no, I'm y saying is switch x. the two different things. Like, switch. You have to put a negative y to the weight. So essentially, make x. x. Y. Oh, here is directly proportional, right? Mm -hmm. If I switch x and y, look at that. Three y equals x. That's switching x and y in this equation. Yep. It's still directly proportional. Still, y equals something times x. Oh, in order to do it, would you have to put like a negative in front of the y? Well, if that were true, then if x is positive, y is always negative. I have negative weight? But I have positive speed? No, I'm not a negative weight. But uh, you would have to have like a bar that would set an average speed, and then your speed would either be a negative or a positive. There is no bar there because, well, OK, let's talk about the graph. The graph for y equals ax, any equation that looks like this is direct variation. Any equation that looks like this, keep in mind there's a plus zero. So any graph that looks like this, where is this y intersect? It's at the zero. It's at origin. No matter what. No matter what this a is, we always go to the origin. So there's not a, yeah. and it goes down from there. That doesn't work that way. That's not direct variation. It doesn't seem to make sense what they've said. Okay, what are the possibilities? The person who wrote that article or made that statement didn't quite understand direct proportionality. Could be. A lot. But let's think about this. Th this is a video game, right? So maybe this is true. Maybe it makes the mechanics of the game work. Because the, it, and it's, it still wouldn't be direct proportionality. But maybe as you run faster, the game makes you way more so that you'll not run as fast. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Right? As the faster I run, the game makes me actually way more, making it harder to run. So, uh, I, so okay. But that's not direct proportionality. You run out of energy. Yeah. Sarah. Maybe something like that. But still, if that's true, it's still not direct proportionality. If this is true, if it really is direct proportionality and my speed goes up and my weight goes up, you can see it's like the faster I run, the heavier I get. And then I just run faster and get heavier and run faster and get heavier. But that's what this is saying. That's what that sentence is saying. That the, that the weight of the player is directly proportional to the speed at which it moves. Maybe they're just oversimplifying it. Maybe they just have it completely wrong. Maybe they just put, instead of the mathematic definition, they put proportional and directly together as an adjective to a... Um, I don't know to where I'm To describe a situation. Yeah. Say that so, Sometimes when it gets said or it gets written down, it's used incorrectly as with any word or phrase. It gets misused sometimes. Usually when people say it's directly proportional to, what they really mean is when one goes up, the other goes up. Now they may go up at different rates, right? Like, look at this graph. X is gonna go up and I'm gonna make Y go up. Is Y still going up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is Y still going up? Yeah. Yeah, but it's not direct proportionality, right? It's not direct variation. Direct variation, the graph for direct variation would make what kind of shape? Curve line. Curve line, y equals mx plus p. Y equals ax plus zero. It would be a straight line. So that's not direct proportionality. So what I'm, what I'm saying here is it gets used colloquially, everyday usage is, and they're just trying to say when one goes up, the other goes up. Directly proportional to, when this goes up, this goes up. But the way in which it goes up, or the rate at which it goes up, may not be what they 
are the same. It's like they're actually the same. Let's look at this one. Inversely proportional. Oh. Federal funds should be distributed in a manner that is inversely proportional to comparative tax. I don't know. What, what does that say? Oh. Uh oh. Oh, this could be a long one. Don't the dicks do the, the views expressed on this website are not necessarily those of me or the school. I don't even know where to find that sentence. Goodness me. Never mind. I don't know what that sentence was. Maybe. reason I want you to be familiar with this phraseology. So when you hear it, you can say to yourself, is that true? Is it directly proportional? Are you using that correctly? Right? And you can be one of those guys who just like corrects people all the time. And like, I just think you're great. Math or injured. Ask one of those people who corrects others a lot. Just like apparently even beyond my wife's uh, you know better judgment to, to say like stop correcting. People don't seem to like it that much, so I don't know. I still keep doing it, I can't stop myself. Uh, anyway, but it is good to be able to examine what people are saying and not just take it at face value. Um, inversely proportional, that's something else completely. Okay, and we'll, we'll talk about that another time. Why goes up, I goes down. That is the way to think about it. Okay, so. Direct here. Y equals a x. So if you want to be directly with x, it means y equals a times x. Uh, let's see, what did all the graphs have in common? The direct variation? They were straight lines. Straight lines? All direct variation graphs. Straight lines? Because right, they're of the form y equals mx plus b. Anything else that they all have in common? Inverse y equals ax plus zero. They all start on the origin. They all yeah. go through the origin. Do we go on to positive? No, you can have a negative. Oh. Yeah, you can negative. Could have a negative slope. Do they always go at a 45 degree angle to the um, y and x line? No, nope, let's look at y equals 3x. Well, it has a y-intercept of 0, a slope of 3. OK. Uh, so it's yeah. Only if it was y equals 1 times x, that would be Um, it could just be a uh, y equals zero. Always positive. Like you can just multiply. If a was zero. If a was zero, that would be directly proportional because that'd be y equals zero x. Oh if yeah, like x always gets multiplied by zero. Y is always zero. That's directly proportional. Are, can they always be positive or all be negative? Because I kind of got it. Can be negative. Y equals negative two. Graph that, that's uh, again, goes to the origin, down to, to the right one. There we go. <laughs> See, could you tell me if I gave you this data here, you had data set for parallel function. What are all functions? All the uh, all direct variations are functions. 
all direct variations are functions, and you put one in, something in, you get something out, you always do is get one thing out. If this were an example of a data set from some function, is it a direct variation? Is this a direct variation? Is it possible? It just meant you got to test it. Okay, how do we test it? Times them all by five. Times them all by five. Well, two times five is ten. So then we should be able to take all of these times five and get the y value. Five times five, yes. Seven times five, yes. Ten times five, yes. Take four times five, yes. Okay, let me give you a little bit of a different one. Let's look at this data set. It is, it, is it direct variation? I don't know. Okay, five. Shouting out 2.37. That's what I found on the first question. How did you find it? I took 11.85 divided by 5. Does that always work? Sometimes. Sometimes it should work? Yeah. Well, let's follow like a line of line. If, if it's direct variation, right? If, uh, if direct variation, then y equals ax, right? That, is, that equation has to exist. Okay, if we have 5 comma 1185, 11.85, then, well, 5 times something has to be 11.85, right? Then 11.85 divided by 5 equals what? 2.37. 2.37, that would have to be A. That would have to be A. Am I right about that? Wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. 5 times 2.37 should give me 11.85, right? It does. And if, if it's right variation, it should, it should be, so this should be 2.37, always, for every x to get to every y. Does it work for 0? 0 times 2.37? Negative 2 times 2.37. No, you get negative 4.74. 4.74? Okay, I'll fix it. Now is it better? Yeah. <laughs> How about now? Four times two point three seven? It works. Twenty nine times. It doesn't work. Oh, it doesn't work. What do you get here? Sixty eight point seven three. Sixty eight point seven three. So even when I fix this negative two thing here, it doesn't work for twenty nine. Even though it worked for all of the other ones, it didn't work for this one. Is this is this an example of direct variation relationship? No. No. Because the A that would have to like whatever A is that you find from this first set has to work for all of them. And it doesn't work for the last one. So it's not. Oh, that's a no. You use 2.42, <laughs> 4, 8, 2, 7, 5, 8, 6. Well, that would work for 29, but then it wouldn't work for any of these other ones. Okay. So then something we can conclude from that is anytime I want to find A, I can just take this guy divided by that guy, right? Because mm -hmm. I want to take this times that is Y. So this divided by that should give me x. That also makes sense because, look, this is the equation that relates x and y. Can I solve for a? Can I get a by itself in this equation? Divided by x. Divided by x. It cancels x. It's y over x equals a. Yeah. Like we didn't even have to do that work. We intuitively saw you got to take y divided by x. For all direct variation equations, a is equal to y divided by x. So if you were asked to graph something as a direct variation, it should go to the origin. It should be a straight line. You just need to know the slope, really. What if I told you that uh, y varies directly with x? OK, that's what that means, varies directly with. And when x is 5, y is uh, 70. Is that enough to write the equation y equals ax? I just need to know what A is, right? Can you tell me what A is, Wes? 
No? I told you this. So based on that, and, and by me telling you that, the, that it is direct variation, that y does vary directly with x, can you use this to tell me what a is? just said a is equal to y over x. Well, y divided by x will give me 14. So the equation is y equals 14 a. Yes? So yeah, so everything started proportional in it too because your y and your x in it are also your slope, right? Because then it's y over y over x, x is, yes, is y over x is the slope. So everything is proportional in it. Because all you have to do is just take your y divided by x, and that's mm -hmm. also your slope. Any y divided by, well, not any x, but any actual order pair that goes together, that y divided by the x always gives you the slope of the line because it goes through 0, 0, right? So if, if you yeah. think about it, if we did y1, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, we could always have 0, 0 as, a, as that other point. We'd always just have like y minus 0 over x minus 0, and y over x would always be the slope. So good observation. Okay. Oh, that was for you. Oh. <laughs> right off your shoulders. Yeah. Like All right. Here we go. Uh, really, all I have left is to do something and, and talk about these. This is, that's direct variation, okay? If I want to verify that some set is direct, is, is, is direct variation, then I can just take this y divided by that x, find out what a would have to be, and then test it on all the x's. Well, that didn't work on this last one, so it's not direct variation. Oh, but this one is because always times five, times five, times five, times five, times five. Okay. If this was something other than negative 20 and it didn't work for that one, well, it wouldn't be direct variation. It's not possible for Graph it, it's always going to go through the origin. You just need to know the slope, draw the slope out. Uh, at any time, we just kind of already said this a is equal to y divided by x. We said y divided by x, you have the slope, you have a, whatever you want to call it, the rate. Like the rate of change of y with respect to x. Uh, well, what I have for you now, we don't have enough time to get too far into it, but we'll get a little bit into it. Is that a question? I'm just going to pass these out. Everybody gets one. Cars, vehicles sold in 2013. I thought it was interesting. The top two vehicles in America Ford F -series. Were, two, were trucks. Were fairly heavy duty trucks. Yeah. I would have thought like a Ford Focus or a Toyota Camry or something would have been the best selling vehicle. But Ford Focus. Actually, pretty far. I mean, there's the Dodge Ram. There's a Civic. That's I a pretty. Like Dodge. The, the Honda Civic is a pretty uh, ubiquitous vehicle. It's everywhere. You see them everywhere. Especially if you're not here, not in Montana. If you live in San Diego, where I used to live, Honda Civic's everywhere. It's all over the place. But it's the number six. I don't know. I found that surprising. So yeah, here would be super good problem. Or trucks. I think there's more trucks. Why would I like to see? Sit down. All right. So what we have here is uh, six pieces of data about each of the cars, vehicles. The cost, the fuel efficiency in the city and on the highway. We got the weight. We got power and torque, okay? If you ask, I don't know what the power and torque is. They're measured in completely different things. These are measured in horsepower. This is measured in foot-pounds. Uh, 
So like the 175 and 175, they really don't really have any things to do with each other. And like as far as the numbers go, like 175, 175, they're measured in completely different units. But here's what I want to ask you. Do you think that uh, with all this data, if I gave you the price of the car, do you think that kind of extrapolating from all this data that we have, do you think that I would give you the price of a vehicle? I mean, regardless of if it was a car, or if it was a truck, or SUV, uh, even a hybrid, the, the Prius is on here. Do you think that would tell me something about its uh, weight? Do price and weight have something to do with each other? Yeah. yeah. Do you think the more expensive the car, the heavier the car? Yeah, more expensive. Uh, maybe, more metal uh, than maybe that's the case. How about, do you think, do you think that I've told you the weight of the car, that, that you can make a, a decent prediction about the fuel efficiency of the car? Also need the torque. Yes. Maybe, yeah. Or maybe. Power. What we're talking about here is correlation. Are, you know, if I pick two of, any two of these, will they be correlated? Will they have something to do with each other? Or will they kind of seem just kind of random all over the place? Here's something that's correlated. Um, let's see. Maybe the price I pay for a pair of shoes and the number of years that it lasts. Some kind of correlation between those two things? Yeah, but it also depends on how long you wear them and how much you wear them. Yeah, it depends on different things. Uh, but would you expect a... I mean, this is for you, for your use. Would you expect a more expensive pair of shoes to last a little longer than a similar pair of shoes yeah, that cost less? Yeah, yeah. Okay, they should. Okay. I'm talking about like, I need some work shoes, okay? Yeah. If I spend more on them, will they last longer? I would think so. Yeah. And if I buy a $20 pair of shoes, are they gonna last very long? No. That's correlation. What's not correlated? How about uh, my number of Facebook friends and the temperature today. No. Are those correlated? No. no. I don't think so. I don't think so. Facebook friends are not as on the mountain. No that might be correlated. Yeah. Now, that, I have to does, it, does more people on the mountain cause more snow to fall? No. No, no. 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 causes more snow to fall. Okay, so the causation is dependent. Now, does, if, if two things are correlated, does it mean that they ca one causes the other? No. Yeah. yeah. No, you know, uh, does does the uh, does the cost of my shoe cause them to last longer? No, no, no. 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 It's, 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 it's some way. It's some way. Kind of a roundabout way. If I'm paying more for them, why are they cost more? Well, one because it probably costs the company more to make them. Also, I'm buying a name. Okay, but uh, in kind of a roundabout way, there might be some kind of a causation. But I'll tell you two things that are correlated. And you tell me if one causes the other. Uh, the uh, temperature outside and the number of violent crimes. They are correlated. No one wants to guess. So they are correlated. They are correlated. As the temperature rises, the number of violent crimes goes up. Once you all get out, it's like the heat, I guess. Uh, so, does hot temperature, or does warm temperature, cause violent crime? Yeah. No. No. It doesn't cause it. It's correlated. They're related to each other. When one goes up, the other goes up. But they are not, it's not caused. Like the, the temperature does not cause people to be more violent. But people are out, there's more opportunity. Like they're, that's why how they're related, right? Uh, as temperature goes up, ice cream sales go up. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's called, yeah. Correlated? Yeah. Is that cause? Yeah. 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 Kind of. Because if it's super hot, it's causing the children's yeah. brain to say, "I need the cool." That's yeah. true. <laughs> They'll take yeah. them in five. There's maybe more, more of a causation there, but it's not a really a cause. It's, it's not really a cause-effect cause relationship. Okay, but it's close. The point here is, is a, a common phrase in, in economics: correlation and in statistic. Correlation does not imply causation. Two things are correlated. It doesn't mean that one caused the other to happen. But it's the mentality that we have a lot. When we see one thing go up and another thing go up, we're like, oh, no, that thing caused another thing to happen. But really, they may be, there's a little more psychology involved too, as to why when this goes up, this goes up. When this goes up, this goes down. It doesn't mean that one thing causes another. Well, I think that 
No, everybody keep, and here's what I want you to do. I'll give you some homework for the direct variation. But also, all I want you to do, okay, is pick two data sets, okay, like cost and weight, or fuel efficiency city, fuel efficiency highway. Weight and power, weight and torque, whatever you want. Two, just two, that you think either are highly correlated, meaning really close, tight relationship there, or you think aren't very correlated. And you just want to show that, like, I don't think price has anything to do with weight. Right? The Prius. It's an expensive car. Is it heavy? No. Not as heavy as a car that's over all the way. Like a really decked out sucky engine. Dodge Durango or something. It's going to be heavier in this one. Jeep Cherokee. So pick two data sets. Two data sets. It's really simple. I just want you to, like, draw a circle around two data sets. And we'll work on seeing how well correlated they are later. Okay? That's it. All right. Mr. Stewart, I'm going to have a little bit more.